Greetings from Texas in the United States. 자, 우리 저, 어, 미국의 텍사스에서 여러분들에게 인사를 전합니다. From Bright Divinity School on the campus of Texas Christian University in Fort Worth, Texas. First, uh, allow me a moment to say thank you to several people. Certainly, I owe a debt of gratitude to Mr. Kim Jo Kwang Su. 또 우리 Kim Jo Kwang Su 감독님께 굉장히 감사를 전하고 싶습니다. 우리 이미 만나서 우리 저녁도 먹고 여러 가지 그 사귀는 그 저기 가졌어요. 밥도 같이 먹고. In particular, I thank Mr. Kim Jo Kwang Su for his endorsement of my book. But I also thank him for his courage and his strength of character. I deeply thank my dear colleague, Dr. Nam Soon Khan, who is she? Who is she? She is here. My translation dancing partner. And Dr. Khan has been tireless in her planning of this trip for me and also. To prepare for the publication of my book, Who Trampled Down the Rainbow Flag. Finally, I want to extend my sincere thanks to the Korean people. You want to be an honorary Korean? Would you Would you ask if they will allow me? Okay, why not? Go ahead. 우리 오늘 저기 하면서 명예 한국의 명예 저 뭐죠 국민이 되고 싶다. 그래서 제가 우리 여기 오신 분들한테. 물어보겠다 그랬어요. 그래서 오신 분들 중에 혹시 반대하는 사람이 있는지 어, 여러분들 혹시 반대하는 분 계시면 다 찬성해요? 아 그럼 큰 얘기를 하셔야 되죠. No objection. So you become an honorary Korean citizen. I'm sorry, Dad. I appreciate it. The remarks that I have for you tonight are brief, but I want to make them from the heart. And the title I have chosen for my remarks tonight was given me by the mother of one of the victims I write about in this book. Her words to me were these: "Remember my child." These are the words of bereaved mother Pauline Mitchell for her dead son FC. I met her in Cortez, Colorado. As I researched the story of the murder of her son, it's a poor woman who works keeping house for other people. Since she is a Navajo Indian, English is not her first language. But she had no problem making her point to me when we met. Her son was a two-spirit or transgender person. So, you're talking about what do you mean by two-spirit? Yeah. Yes. He was murdered when he was 15 years old. His mother said to me at the end of our interview, "My boy was beautiful. He did nothing wrong, and now he is dead and killed." She looked at me with her eyes full of tears, and she said, "Don't let the world do this to anyone else's child. Tell his story, Doctor Sprinkle." And that is what I've tried to do for the past six and a half years. I spent four and a half years researching this book, visiting with families and broken-hearted lovers of all of these stories in my book. I used my vacations and the breaks that we had from school in order to travel to the places where these people lived and died. The stories in this volume include 14 representative people who died simply because of who they were. And for the past two and a half years, I have tried my best to tell their story wherever people would listen. So it is a particular honor to be in Korea and to begin talking with you about this very difficult subject. That some may even find difficult to relate to. I realize better now than before I set foot on Korean soil that the discourse about sexual minority hate crimes is just beginning in this wonderful country. The reason that I tell these stories is not because they by themselves get anything done, 
fire us because they relate to the way we live. By themselves, these are just particular stories. They may be interesting because of the drama of their lives and deaths, but there is far more to them than that. While the horror and death fell upon them each individually, every one of these people represent someone you and I can relate to. Though all of them were members of the sexual minority, they relate to us because they share our common humanity. These stories relate to us because they could be our friend, our brother, our mother, our father, our sister. They share our wants and our needs, our hopes and our dreams. And telling and retelling these stories allow them to speak from the grave to us. So I hope that you will take these stories to heart and get to know these people. Because they could be your neighbor, your friend, your co-worker, or the student who studies beside you in university. See, in Korea, just as in the United States, there may be someone you know very well who is hiding, afraid to tell you who he or she is. They should not have to hide in fear any longer. But they do so because they know that it is risky to reveal who they are in a world that does not yet want to understand them. You see, in my research, I learned that there have been over 13,000 men, women, boys, and girls who have died as a result of anti-gay sex hate crimes in the United States of America alone. 1982. Mm -hmm. Many more thousands have committed suicide as students in school because they could not see a way out for themselves. So it is our societies with their ignorance, fear, and prejudice of the sexual minority that has created the atmosphere in which violence like this is possible. So my task is to help you see that the pain and promise of these people is an opportunity for us to help set people free. In order to do that, I would like to tell you two brief stories. I thank Alma very much for the beautiful design of this book. I think that it is better than the original design that was done by the publisher in America. I'm going to speak briefly about these two people. This person, Ryan Keith Skipper, and this person, Sakia Latona Gunn. Uh, chapters 7 and 8 in the book. The first is Ryan Keith Skipper of Auburndale, Florida, in central Florida. He was murdered in the deep of night at 25 years of age by two young men who said they were doing the world a service by killing another fan. Ryan Skipper was picked on when he was a young boy in elementary school. Some of us in this room have had experience of being picked on in school. We know what that feels like. Some of his cruel classmates said Ryan Skipper had too much sugar in his blood. In Korean context, yeah. that doesn't make sense, but I think they are. Yes, yes. Yeah. They thought that he was effeminate and weak. He wanted to be strong, but the harassment continued all throughout his school experience. His best friend told me that when he was in high school, boys threw rocks and rotten oranges at him when he was walking away from school to go home. So it isn't a surprise, is it, that he had a negative self-opinion early. He was taught to feel that way by the people he went to school with. After he graduated from school, he started to work for himself and he began to feel better about himself. Ryan embraced the fact that he was truly a gay man. 
He overcame his fear and he came out to his mother and his father. His mother and his father embraced him with love and said, we love you completely. And his mother told me that she said to him, I had suspected that you were gay before you told me. And Ryan said, and so you don't hate me? Or you don't believe that God hates me? His mother said, don't be silly, Ryan. Of course I love you. And God made you this way. So how could God hate you? By the time he was 25, he had a good job and he had saved money. He was working selling designer sunglasses and he was good at it. He had a boyfriend that he cared about very much whom he took home to introduce to his mother and father. He bought himself a new car. It was small, but it was his, and he loved it. Everybody I met told me how much Ryan loved that little car. One night, two men he knew in the neighborhood knocked on his door and asked for a ride to the store late at night. Ryan did not know that they had been planning to take his life for weeks. They wanted his car and they believed that they could get it because he was gay and weak and they could kill him. So they told him that they really needed to go to the store, that they needed to buy some medicine for their friends. And Ryan overcame his reluctance and probably overcame his better sense of fear and agreed to take them to the store. It was the last trip he would ever make on this earth alive. As they drove down the road, one of the young men drew a large knife and set it beside his throat and said, turn down this lonely road. When they discovered his body the next morning, he was already dead because he had bled to death in the grass. An old woman who was going home late from work discovered his body lying in the grass by the side of the road. She said that there was so much blood everywhere it looked as if someone had turned on a sprinkler full of blood. When the coroner did the autopsy on his body, she discovered that he had been stabbed 78 times. They threw him out by the side of the road and took the car because they were going to try to resell it to drug dealers. But since they had slaughtered him in the car, there was too much blood to take directly for sale. They tried to clean it, but they couldn't get it clean. And the drug dealers they tried to sell the car to would not buy it because they sensed that something was terribly wrong about it. So these two young men decided they had to destroy the car in order to destroy the evidence of their crime. See, they had robbed him for nothing. Their hatred had gotten away with them and they were stuck with a car they couldn't sell. Now, the only thing humorous about all of this story to me is that these two young men were not very smart. In fact, they were stupid. They wanted to set fire to the car, which made sense. Because if they burned the interior of the car, then all of the evidence would be destroyed. So, they set fire to the interior of the car, but they shut the door with the door with the windows rolled up. Stupid. <laughs> when the fire went out, then as a last resort, they pushed Ryan's beloved little car into a lake, thinking that nobody would find him. You see, they honestly believed, since he was a gay man, nobody would care that they had killed him. They were so wrong. His father, Lynn, took me to the place where they discovered his body. And he stood in that spot and said, My son has not died in vain. Both of these young men were arrested and charged with the murder in the first degree of Ryan Keith Skipper. And now they are serving life sentences without the possibility of parole 
in a Florida prison. They were charged with murder as an anti-gay hate crime. Oh. The attorneys who defended the two young killers tried to put Ryan Keith Skipper's memory on trial. The attorneys tried to make the jury believe that somehow Ryan Skipper was responsible for his own murder. It is a customary strategy in a society where homosexuality is disapproved of. These attorneys were trying to get a lower sentence by blaming Ryan Skipper for being homosexual and building on the prejudice of people in the jury. But of course they failed and now Ryan Skipper's parents, his mother and father, and his brother have become some of the most effective human rights advocates that I have ever met. They are traveling and speaking everywhere they can to stop bullying in schools and to make gay people feel as though they can be safe and secure in their own neighborhoods and families. Mm -hmm. The second story I wish to tell briefly is about this person. The African-American lesbian girl, Sakia Latona Gunn. She died in Newark, New Jersey when she was 15 years old. As she tried to defend her girlfriend, the man who wanted to rape them both stabbed her to death in the heart. Sakia Gunn grew up in poor neighborhoods in Newark, New Jersey, just across the Hudson River from New York City. They did not feel free to be open about who they were in Newark, New Jersey, but right across the river was Greenwich Village, where they could be free. It only cost $2.50 to travel on the train from Newark, New Jersey to Greenwich Village, New York. Kids can go to the city to spend the day. And in the summer, young gay kids from the New Jersey shore travel to New York to have a wonderful time. It's wonderful to be young and be in love, isn't it? On that summer's day that Sakia and her girlfriend went to Greenwich Village, they were in love and they were free. They went to the Chelsea Piers, which look out upon the Hudson River. They played the latest music and they danced, they smoked cigarettes and they kissed. When the sun went down, it came time to go home, so they caught the train from the New York side back to New Jersey. But they had to walk from the train station to catch a bus to go home. Late at night when a big man drove up in a white station wagon and began to try to get them to climb in his vehicle. Later, this man, an African American himself, confessed that he suspected they were both lesbian girls. He thought he could intimidate two young African-American girls, threaten them with exposing that they were lesbian, and get the sex from them that he wanted. Chris. So he got out of the car, a big, powerful man, and he said to them, come with me and I'll show you a good time. Sakia feared him, and she also feared that he would hurt her girlfriend. So she said, we're not that way. That is when this big powerful man lunged to grab Sakia's girlfriend and drag her into his car. Sakia was young, but she was strong. She played basketball in high school. So she took her fist and hit him in the face. He turned on her, whipped out a switchblade knife, and stabbed her in the chest. Then he ran from the scene of the crime. Hello. Sakia died in the arms of her girlfriend on the way to a nearby hospital emergency room. When news got out that Sakia had been murdered for being a lesbian, her family feared that no one would come to the funeral. They were brokenhearted and they said, that they would have a small funeral without too many people attending it. You see, African American communities in the United States often reject, le reject lesbians and gay men. And her mother and her grandmother feared that the rejecting society would not honor her in her death.
no one in Newark, New Jersey was prepared for how big that funeral became. There were thousands of young African American students who turned out to remember Sakia Gunn. And they brought candles and flowers and stuffed animals and took them to the place where she had died and created a memorial for her. That does not mean that the community all of a sudden embraced homosexuality. But the community understood that she had died because she was a lesbian and they could not tolerate that kind of violence against their youth. They arrested the man who had killed her, tried him, and he is in a New Jersey prison serving a life sentence today. A fine African American filmmaker named Charles Bennett Brack made a documentary film in her honor. It's a very powerful film called Dreams Deferred, the Sakia Gun Story. Sakia Gun Story. Now these two stories illustrate some important truths for us to think about for just a moment together. First, these killings that I describe in this book are not usual killings. They are anti-gay hate crimes aimed at the entire LGBTQ community. They are message killings, assassinations. When a gay person commits suicide or is murdered because of their sexual orientation, the news of it spreads by word of mouth like wildfire. And the message that it sends is that gay people should stay closeted and silent and invisible if they don't want to die. That leads to the second point I want to make about these killings. These killings are intended to wipe out the memory of the people they kill and to drive the gay community back into slavery. The killers who wield the knives and shoot the guns have been enabled to do that by the apathy and prejudice of a society that disapproves of gay people. Violence against gay people does not come out of nowhere. Good. It comes out of the ignorance, fear, and apathy of society as a whole. That's why stories like those of Ryan and Sakia force the whole society to take a hard look at itself. Good. In a society like this in Korea, where people are afraid even to name themselves as gay, the situation is ripe for violence like this to break out. Just because people refuse to talk about it doesn't mean that the problem is not there. And as people begin to have the courage to come out and to sing and to dance and to be alive and be free, then Korea is going to have to come to grips with its own apathy, fear, and ignorance about homosexuality. These stories of the dead in my book do not condemn anyone. Instead, they are voices from the dead asking us to do better than what happened to them. Pauline Mitchell said to me, don't let this happen to anyone else's child. And as the conscience of society is pained and begins to change, then the possibility for greater freedom arises. What do we not want for people to be free, to live openly, and to love joyously? Is this not what we all wish for our children? That they live good lives and happy lives. The parents of these people who have died, in every instance I know of, told me that they wanted these stories to be told so the same mistakes would not be made again. Here in Korea, you are beginning to find ways to talk about homosexuality and hate crimes, and I applaud you for that. The courage of Mr. Kim jong un the courage of Alma Books, is helping that to happen in this society. They are taking a risk in favor of a better world for everybody, not just for themselves. A freer world for everybody, not just for themselves. And I hope that these stories will give a new sense of voice to the conversation that must go on in Korea so that finally everybody can be free. 
I close with this one little piece of news. 자, 제가 이제 two years ago, Ryan Skipper's older brother and his wife had a brand new baby girl. 자, they named their little girl Ryan Skipper. Because they can use the name Ryan either for a boy or a girl. And his brother sent me a beautiful picture of this little girl playing beside the grave of her uncle Ryan. A beautiful, innocent little girl was toddling toward her father, carrying the name of her dead uncle. You see, that is the point. The people who murdered Ryan Skipper thought that they were erasing his memory from the face of the earth, but they failed. Because now, there is a brand new Ryan Skipper alive in the world. From my heart to you, Kon Samida. <laughs>and reading it back into their faith. The problem is not the Bible, but the way that people are interpreting it. So, I appreciate the question about the two passages and let me deal with them briefly. First, Leviticus chapter 18 and Leviticus 20. The Leviticus passage is particularly deadly when it is misinterpreted. Because it says that men who sleep with men, as men who sleep with women, ought to be condemned to death and are called abominations. But actually, the book of Leviticus calls a lot of things abominations, not just men who sleep with men. It says that a person who wears clothing that has mixed fibers, maybe cotton and wool together, is an abomination too. As well, how many of you are wearing mixed fibers tonight? I think uh, nearly everybody. You, yeah. Everybody. Why is it that these people are so ready to condemn homosexuals, but they will not check the clothing labels on their own clothes? Yes, as a matter of fact, if anyone here likes to eat seafood, especially shrimp, yeah, you're an abomination too, according to the book of Leviticus. I don't see anybody out there picketing against seafood restaurants, and so the same people who condemn homosexuality love to eat shrimp. The book of Leviticus says you shall not plant two types of seeds that are different in the same field. What the writers are concerned about is not who anybody sleeps with or who anybody loves. They are concerned about purity. This is an ancient concern that we no longer have. That is why Christian fundamentalists ignore most of what the book of Leviticus says and lift up one verse that agrees with their hatred. That is why I say that they are taking their homophobia and reading it back into the text of the Bible that has nothing to do with homosexuality at all. Leviticus passage is concerned with pure faith and what they are saying is that people should not sleep with other people like them in fertility rites for pagan gods and goddesses. What these priestly writers are doing is using the worst example they can think of, something they don't like, two men sleeping together, to stand as a metaphor for mixing belief in pagan gods and belief in the Israelite God. So the passage rightly understood is about heresy and not about homosexuality.
Because it doesn't have anything to do with homosexuality. Those ancient Israelite priests did not know anything about loving, committed relationships between same-sex partners. So my point with them, with respect, is to say the passage does not have anything to do with the hatred you have in your heart. The passage in Romans is the most quoted passage used against homosexual people. And Christian fundamentalists link Romans 1 with Leviticus 18 and 19 to say that somehow homosexuality is an abomination condemned by God. You will remember that women were not even mentioned in Leviticus. What about two women who sleep with each other? That is never addressed in the book of Leviticus. But Paul talks about women and men who have what he calls unnatural desires. Paul we guys have a desire to, to study or learn. It's unnatural. It's unnatural. Just like the priestly writers in Leviticus, the Apostle Paul did not know anything about loving, committed, monogamous, same-sex relationships. What he knew about was pederasty and temple prostitution. So, when someone quotes the book of Romans to me, I want to say to them, fine, let's read what Paul says very closely together. You see, they've not read it carefully. The only thing they have done is read it in accordance with their own prejudice and fear. Paul is really concerned about idolatry and pagan religion. He opens his letter and he says that because everyone is without excuse before God and people had given themselves over to worshiping creatures rather than the Creator, God gave them over to a depraved mind. He says that idolatry is the real sin that he wants to to destroy. So he says, there are all kinds of things in human life that go wrong when you worship a statue of wood or stone. I don't think the Apostle Paul had any particular quarrel with men who loved men or women who loved women. He had a quarrel with idolaters. If you read that passage carefully, you will see that he gives a whole list of things that go wrong with people when they are idolaters. It isn't the fact that a man loves a man or a woman loves a woman that is unnatural and against the will of God. It is that a person who worships a creature rather than the Creator is against the will of God. If you read the rest of what Paul has to say about human sexuality, he doesn't like any of it very much. I would to God that you were all as I am. Well, I don't know what he meant. Maybe he meant that he was single and he wanted everybody to be single. But he didn't get his way of doing that either, did he? <laughs> Conclusion, the best thing a person can do is to get these people to read the text carefully with you. When that happens, their arguments fall apart.